I need to share screen. Um, wait a moment, sorry. Why do I always make a mistake? Okay. No. Okay. This. So now, do you see my screen? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Fernando, can you stop me? Because. Um... Okay, stop. No, like uh, not when, I, when okay. I go too long, okay, give me, okay. give me uh, I don't know, tell me something in 15 minutes, otherwise I can talk forever. Okay, uh, so you have 30 minutes, right? No, it's it's shorter because we make, we put other talks in the middle. I mean, actually, Jess is not talking. We invited Esperance to talk, but I'm not sure what she answered. So I probably want to leave space for her in the end of the day. So anyway, the first thing is, what's the point of an introduction to something in the last day of of a workshop uh, and uh, yes it made total sense so <laughs> basically i'm um, doing a talk which is masked from an introduction to genetic epidemiology but, but basically i will end up presenting my work but with a very uh, big introduction um, so epidemiology what, uh, do you see my screen yes you do so when you when you talk about epidemi epidemiology, it's kind of putting together the personal information of the patient, like age, sex, ethnicity, where they live, if they have any travel history, risk factors, whatever, with the medical information that you have from uh, his medical history. No, no, not his medical history, actually, what's happening then, and then also the medical history, but what's happening in that moment, so symptoms where it's... Uh, in which hospital it is, in which ward, which treatment uh, they get prescribed and everything. And you try to put together this information to uh, make more sense of what's happening to the patient of the diseases. And, but when you go to infectious disease epidemiology, there is a next layer uh, to this that is the pathogen. I mean, uh, there is a next layer now uh, in in, in recent, in the last, I don't know, in recent years. Um, and this is the pathogen sample. So you can learn uh, from uh, the patient, from the it's, uh, medical information, but also from the patient. And why is this so important? Does this thing that you have even the pathogen sample change a lot? Uh, well, this is an example from real life. Uh, recently real life, uh, it was like 2021, uh, October 26, 2021. So basically in the US they found four cases of melioidosis for patients, uh, which who they analyzed the bacterial sample and they were infected by this Barcoldiria pseudomale, which is a bacteria that you won't expect in the US. And uh, it's particularly endemic in subtropical regions. And this one was from Southern Asia. But uh, these four patients had no link whatsoever among them. They were in different states. They had different like social profile, age, job, not job, retired, lots of different things. And none of them had recent history of travel. So what? The only thing that they really had, it, it really looked like a CSI episode. And the only thing they really had in the end, after they compared everything from standard old school epidemiology, they had to resort to the, to, the, to the pathogen sample. And then they sequenced it. And when they sequenced it, uh, they, compared the, the, they compared the samples, they compared the genomes, and they saw that these four samples were related. So 
whatever was the link, the, there was a link between these four patients. It, it wasn't four random samples, ra random events that had no connection. There was a connection. And the only thing to tell them there was a connection was the genome of the bacteria. And then they had to dig into the life of these four people uh, to find out what was that, which was the link. Because if the bacteria is the same, the bacteria doesn't lie. If the genome of the bacteria is the same, then there is a link and you have to find the link. And finally, they found uh, the link in a aromatherapy spray that the four patients bought, uh, and it was pro produced in the places where uh, barcoldiria is endemic. And so the sample in the aromatherapy spray was contaminated. And uh, uh, the four patients had sold in, uh, in Walmart, I think. And then the four patients bought it. And then uh, they got infected. And uh, I think one of them died even. Right? So, um, but I mean, you do understand that if there wasn't the genome, um, they wouldn't have found the trace and the link between these people. Because just when they saw the genome and the genomes were similar, uh, they sampled everything in the houses of these people until they found the, the culprit. And, um, and here, while I was looking to put this into the slides, I found this that probably is interesting, I mean, from, the, from Cornelia's point of view of things, because then uh, when the culprit was found, uh, probably being an aromatherapy spray, it could have been in lots of houses in the US and uh, in the... Um, in the CDC um, press release, there was this sentence that you see at the end, because of course they didn't want the sample to end up in the environment and contaminate the US and become endemic in the US. Uh, so, I mean, th there is a lot of things that can happen, but I mean, this, I think this example shows, that, shows exactly why genomic epidemiology is important and very useful. So, why, what happened? This is the development that made possible genomic epidemiology that we have now. It, I, I choose this image from, from the internet because it goes back to the microscope that Jamie mentioned uh, um, on Wednesday. Uh, but the two things, uh, do you see my pointer, my, my, my mouse? Well, yes, you, we okay. see we see your pointer. Don't worry. Okay. If, then, if anything things, goes wrong, I will tell you. Thank you. And then the two things that made the genomic epidemiology that we know now possible was one, the PCR, although it's not the one that we know now. I mean, like, uh, there are, I will explain myself in a couple of slides. So in the 80s and uh, the sequencing machines from the mid, uh, from the mid 2000s. So skip, so X, and this is what I meant, uh, since the Sanger sequencing uh, and um, PCR was started, uh, things that are called multilocus sequence typing were developed. Uh, that is basically uh, an array of uh, small frag smallish fragments from a handful of genes. Uh, but if you patch them all together, and uh, you, you make a tree with these pieces of the, of the seven genes, you have a pretty reliable tree that uh, mirrors the tree that you get when you use whole genome sequencing. And uh, okay, I, I put reference and an image from a Claremont paper uh, because like I worked in the group of Eric Denamur, Olivier Tenayon, so I know this one, but there are uh, different, um, different multilocal sequence uh, MLSCs uh, um, like schemes. And for E. coli, there is the Pasteur one, the Warwick one, and there is another one. Uh, and there are four other bacteria, but still this uh, made possible to establish a a uh, phylogenetic rela relationship between samples that you might have found in the hospital. So before, uh, before the late 70s, 80s, you were just able to, um, to uh, describe the species, so E. coli, non E. coli, or 
not much more than this. While with MLS seed, you have a very fine grained uh, detail of how related the E. coli strains are. Um, and even you have the detail of the strain. So you can say, uh, if your samples that you are collecting in the hospital are from the same strain or for different strains. And this is really helpful, helpful to narrow down. But of course, does it work? Okay. But of course, the great, sorry, the great uh, revolution arrived with uh, in the mid 2000s when sequencing became much cheaper and much more feasible. And then we could have whole genome sequences of the samples, uh, which contain much more information, including plasmids. So why aren't my slides working? Oh, okay. So what does the genetic analysis add to the outbreak investigation? As you said, as you saw in the previous example, a lot. But from, um, so we can add the zero one classification like the pathogen that is infecting this uh, patient is the same or is different, which can mean it is an E. coli or non an E. coli or an E. coli of the same strain or not, or the same resistance or not, but, it can also add a much more uh, nuanced information. That is, uh, if uh, when you build a tree, and if the uh, different patient, the pathogens in the different patients are related, and how much so, and if there is the possibility that two two uh, samples find in two different patients are part of, of a common infection chain, and how does this work? And this is a very brief and sketchy description of how phylogenomics work. So basically, uh, no, basically you get, sorry, I close this. So basically you have, for the, from the patients, you have the sample, you sequence the samples and you have an alignment and you align them and we are not going into how you do this. Uh, but in the end, you get an alignment. And in the alignment, you see mutations. The mutations are these dots. So all the yellow parts uh, in the different uh, genomes are, see, are the same in all the samples you are seeing. Each sample is coming, each sample is coming from a different patient. And all the point mutations, all the um, uh, color dots that you see here are point mutations. So, Let's start from patient one and patient two, who, who basically show every, uh, share everything except this, uh, I don't know, orangish mutation. So when you, you connect them and then you put the mutation in uh, P1. No, sorry. And then you can add also patient three, who differs from P1 and P2, because they have the green mutation here, but they don't have the purple mutation here. So the purple mutation is in the common line between P1 leading to P1 and P2, while the green, the green mutation is just on the line from P3. And then, oh, I'm going in there. And then you go on, like for P4 and P5, the only difference is the purple one. And then here you go, all the ones, uh, all like P1, P2, P3, P4, and P5 share the orange one. So you have to put it in a branch that is leading to the five of them, while only P1, P2, and P3 share the red one. So you have to put in this branch, but the order really, you don't know which one is the order here. Um, and then you can do the same for the other three, and then you connect them. And here now you have made a tree from the samples you brought from the hospital. And so you have the relationship between all these samples. And here there is a note to add, that is that the mutation, there is an assumption that the mutations appear at an approximately constant rate in time. And so the length of the three branches are approximately proportional to the time elapsed, elapsed between the connection. Now, the approximately, uh, this is uh, from SARS-CoV-2 evolution. As you can see, the approximately is not so much approximately. You, it's quite a reliable thing. You see uh, the mutations appear. Uh, so 
on the x axis that is there is time and on y axis there is the number of limitations compared to the one sample and um, the colors uh, denote the different uh, strains uh, variants it's called in sars cov 2 anyway the different variants that have been named but as you can see, all these, the fit to all these uh, uh, number, to all these points is quite a reliably straight line. So you can say that the, the mutations appear quite at a constant rate in time. Uh, sorry, this is from viruses and not from bacteria, but. Um, and what does it change? And this is from MRSA, but it's to show you what does it mean that you can use uh, um, the time? So uh, as, if you focus here on the tree, each uh, branch finishes in the moment in which it has been collected. So those ones were collected before the 2000s, while these ones were collected around 2010. And then using the molecular clock, you can not only draw the tree, but putting these ones, uh, um, the sampling time in the tree, inserting it, you can have a reliable, I mean, reliable enough uh, date for the most recent common ancestor. So the, you see this uh, node here that is basically the most recent common ancestor of all of these that, is, uh, that was around the ancestor of an outbreak is in the um, mid uh, early mid 90s so you you can uh, you can have a you can have a time for the most recent common ancestor and this is quite valuable in a sense when you are dealing with outbreaks um, but apart from these details of phylogenomics, you can add on top of the um, mutation and of the tree, you can add things like the, uh, when the samples were, were sampled, this is in another way. Uh, and so for example, these two P1 and P2 and P3 might seem related, but P1 and P2 are sampled much, in, much before and very uh, close by while P3 is sampled much later. So is this part of the same outbreak? Mm, we don't know. On the other hand, P6 was sampled at the same time of, uh, I mean, the we don't know is we need to understand if there is enough time for the mutation, for the purple mutation and the green mutation to appear. It could be, we don't know. But for example, P6, was sampled at the same time of P1 and P2, and clearly from the tree is not part of the same outbreak. And you can go on like this and put all together them, and then you see P7 and P8 are on, on the same time and on the same branch, so maybe also those two are part of a different outbreak, but similar together. And on top of this, you can add any more inf another information that is in this case the word, but the world in which they were sampled, but it can be a different nation, it can be whatever, geography. And so you see that seven and eight were sampled at the same time from the same world, while P1 and P2 were sampled at the same time from different worlds. And so you need to understand if there is a common source that caused P1 and P2 to be in different worlds, or if there is transmission between worlds. So there are a lot of different layers in genetic epidemiology that you can go, you can add to get a complete information about the outbreak you are investigating. And this is something uh, much more amazing that has been done in viruses. Sorry, I'm, um, I'm taking viruses as, as examples. Uh, and they were really able to trace um, the outbreak going around in different nations. The thing is that these data sets spanned uh, some more than 20 years, while uh, an, an hospital outbreak um, 
rarely you have this kind of data, but not never because you, sometimes you do. So um, how am I going up with time? You have spoken for 18 minutes and a half. Okay, there is this video that is amazing. I want to show you the video because they did a video, no? And you really see in real time the different, like you see the tree on the left that is starting now on the bottom with the, the years. And then you see the different alleles appearing on the bottom right. And then you see how they map into the geography. I mean, this work was amazing. And you see everything, how it maps on the tree and how it maps on the geography. Um, and this is what we try to do when we have enough information. And yeah. So yeah, I've shown you the video. And then I've talked too much. Um, uh, no. Um, so what about the plasmids? Because uh, what do you use in genetic epidemia? Like, what if it, it is a plasmid outbreak? And well, I wanted to show this very fast because this is my work and it's a plasmid outbreak. Uh, it was 55 samples from 48 patients uh, in one year. Um, and it helps uh, explaining which are the problems in trying to trace this kind of outbreak. So first of all, we were lucky because OXA48 is carried in a very conserved plasmid. So we can run all this analysis using short read sequences, which uh, doesn't happen most of the time in plasmids, as you've seen already. And the first thing was that they were chosen by um, um, in, in they were characterized first in the lab and then sequenced. So uh, they were chosen for their resistance, but in the end, after we sequenced, we saw that there was only one allele that was OCTA48. So it was most probably a plasmid outbreak because it's carried in a very conserved plasmid and it's often carried in, an out, in a plasmid. Uh, when we built the tree, uh, the samples, as you can see, were really, really, really similar in the outbreak. But as you can see, the, the color of the, of the leaves is the species they were found into. So we had at least four species. Uh, and in each of the species, each one of the colors is a different strain, except for the dark blue one, which are all E. coli SC399. So a lot of different, different bacterial hosts. And when we mapped the mutations, uh, those mutations in the upper line here, uh, where, uh, where the ones that um, characterized the reference plasmid that was sequenced in 2001 with respect to the rest of the plasmids in the outbreak. So these ones were 129 mutations. And uh, while around- It will be better if you put your screen in a presentation mode. Master. Yes, no, sorry. I uh, go here. I don't want to go through all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So, okay. Uh, these are like these red dots are the one that characterize the, the samples in the outbreak, and they are like 25 mutations. Sometimes some of them were repeated, uh, but the other ones are 129. Of course, uh, uh, the question was, is this a result of co-adaptation between OXA48 and uh, S3399? Um, so one question was, how, how many mutations did we expect? Now, of course, I don't fool much of the audience because when you see this uh, distribution of mutation, you think about recombination as I do. So of course, uh, how many point mutation do you expect is that? Uh, kind of naive question to ask in this context, but it helps us understand which are the problems or some of the problems of doing um, of doing genetic epidemiology with plasmids. So, uh, yeah, 
ah, I put this slide to show you that it is a combination probably. So it's not simple because, okay, the length of the plasmid was defined, fine, well defined, but the number of generation between the reference, so the number of mutations you expect is the mutation rate times the length of the plasmid times the uh, number of generation that are elapsed before, between the reference plasmid and the outbreak. Okay, this is an easy formula, but the length of the plasmid, this is easy too, because it was this length and there were no major structural variation. It was 61, 80, 80, 881 base pairs. But when we go to the number of generation uh, between the reference plasmid and the outbreak, well, do I take um, the number of generation that any coli would have? Or uh, because every time there is a conjugation, the plasmid is replicated, and each replication brings with itself a probability of mutation. So, what do we do? In the end, I assumed that uh, I, I discarded the duplications and I just used the number of generations uh, I would have found in, in E. coli, so seven generations a day. And then the mutation rate. Because the mutation, the plasmid to mutate is using the machinery of the host it is into. But then uh, this is in this outbreak, there are four different bacterial hosts. So which one do we do we prefer? And in the end, I use the E. coli mutation rate uh, because the main host is probably E. coli. Anyway, you get this number and you you don't know really how to treat it. But the thing that you notice is that you expect 0.2 mutations and you find 129. So, and they are, so there is probably co-adaptation or something or, or whatever it is, this plasmid is, uh, uh, is a different variant of the plasmid and it's well suited for that background. Uh, anyway, this is just a low, lower bound. And as I explained you, there are lots of assumptions uh, hidden in this number. And then we try, uh, given this and giving the idea that, uh, given that this number was supporting the idea that the epidemic, uh, that, that there was a kind of a coevolution or an adaptation to S3399. So we assumed that uh, the, the outbreak dynamic was that there was a main out, a outbreak sustained by the clonal expansion of E. coli S399 with the plasmid, and that all the other bacterial hosts that we found were resulted from an intra-host plasmid conjugation. And then we proceeded to model this in order to uh, be able to infer a conjugation rate, whatever it means in this context. Now, uh, I skip this because we are late. Basically, the model is in the paper and I will not go in the details of the model, but we were able to, uh, to find out, to determine an effective conjugation rate, whatever it means. And it was per lineage per year. And here we go back to what Fernando said and other speakers said that uh, you don't measure a conjugation rate. So how do we compare this uh, with what you see in the lab? And this is the and, and this is why I put all these slides because this is what probably Diana and Olivia will be telling us. And I'm so happy to hear it. Now, unfortunately, this was just a bioinformatic um, analysis and modeling analysis, but of course, what I would have liked was to uh, give the plasmid and the host to Tatiana or whoever else is doing experiments and uh, find out, uh, or Jamie, or uh, there were lots of talks, um, and find out whether there was really a or tal. Um, there was really a, a, an adaptation or a coevolution or whatever, and basically whether the plasmid, this allele of the plasmid put in another uh, bacterial background that was not ST399 was uh, faring better or worse. But of course, we didn't uh, have this kind of collaborators. Um, and then, of course, the advantages of trying to do this kind of studies, uh, but this is uh, okay. trying to do this kind of studies is that we 
find more fine grained information on the outbreak dynamics and greater understanding of the AMR spreading dynamics. But of course, there are a lot of things that we need to fix, like uh, or the sample size, sequencing and assembling, as we said, is very difficult. And uh, the most difficult point for me is that point mutations are not the dominant evolutive mechanism of plasmids, but phylogenetics theory relies on point mutations and uh, not on gene loss. And, so with, using gene loss and acquisition, you can build a tree, but there is no clock. And so, yes, this is my main problem. And I've said it already a lot of times, so you know. And the more general problems sometimes is that the sampling is seldom ag agnostic. So um, um, most of the time, the, uh, the sampling relies on this, this resistance in this species, while we know that plasmids can jump uh, through very different species. Uh, most of the time we don't have controls and this has to been raised a lot in this workshop because we have seldom plasmids with no MR genes or not, of, I mean, sample for the sake of seeing the plasmid. And uh, one, another thing that I really would like to have is non-clinical sampling. Although I know it's difficult and it's not something uh, you cannot go around to people in the market and say, can I swab you? But anyway, uh, it is a problem. What, what plasmids do we found? Do we find in healthy individuals? And this is my opinion, and I put all of this here just uh, to discuss with you because I am really uh, I, I want to hear your opinion because, of course, uh, we are looking at this problem from very different point of views, and uh, I can only learn from your opinions. And uh, okay, there are a lot of talks. Um, I mean, not, despite these problems, uh, there is a lot of great research uh, we, using uh, hospital-based uh, data sets on plasma genetic epidemiology. Two of these talks, uh, we've already seen them. Three of them are coming up after this. And uh, many more talks through the workshop uh, um, discuss various points that I touched here. And OK, the acknowledgments for this talk are uh, John, uh, who, OK, I put it double, sorry, uh, who uh, gave me the data set, and the little Liam, because without their help in simplifying the model, in writing the model, uh, nobody would have like enjoyed the, the paper. Uh, the paper is uh, out on archive and it's soon to appear in microbial genomics. And that's it, sorry, for the long time. And I'm happy to take any question. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Alice. Very nice talk. I have uh, one question if nobody else is raising hands. Uh, and is, this question is, we all know that uh, SNPs, I mean, mutation, point mutations are not the only thing, but an, a horizontal gene transfer is probably much more important in the short run. But what's the role of recombination? I mean, I don't know, uh, has, has been, this been measured really? How does recombination uh, affect the trees that are made in short term, you know, in outbreak uh, analysis? I, I don't know, but those, I mean, when you saw the, where the mutations were, those in this outbreak were clearly recombination, like homologous recombination. And, uh, and I didn't, because there wasn't nothing in the middle. So I didn't know whether they were acquired at different steps or uh, uh, I have no idea. So, well, I don't know. Yeah, I mean. So is it, but it's very important, you know, because in, for instance, when you uh, produce these nice trees of the uh, SARS, coronavirus, uh, there apparently there's no recombination. So everything is accumulation of mutations, apparently right? Apparently it is, yeah. But in, in, in bacterial phylogenetic trees, 
of any species, how much of it is recombination and how much is real phylogeny, you know? I don't know because I mean, the pro one of the problem is that there are so many different fields. So maybe there is somebody who has measured it and we don't know because it's, I mean, it's not involved with us. Does anybody in the audience know? Does anybody have any idea, suggest any paper? Okay. Nobody. Well, well okay, thank you. We can go on with the session, I think, or is there a break? Hello, Cornelia. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question, so I didn't measure <laughs> the combination. Um, but what I would find interesting, um, whether uh, you decided uh, to focus on backbone genes, so of the plasmid, or of acquired genes, because I think um, this might be possibly uh, quite interesting because I believe that the backbone genes do not evolve that fast as, for instance, resistant genes or uh, transposons, but uh, maybe there are other opinions about this. But that's why I typically decide uh, or differentiate between acquired genes on the plasmid and the backbone. Yeah, makes sense. So we are running uh, incredibly late. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I completely, I, I'm the worst chair ever. Um, so yeah, I think we need to have Alvaro starting his talk. Also because I mean, 